Are we good? Yep, we're good. Okay. Well, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Jonathan Rogers as our Grand Round speaker for today. Um, when Dr. Hackers gave me the opportunity to invite a Grand Round speaker, uh, I very quickly realized I wanted Jonathan to come talk to us. Um, reading his work over the past few years has been absolutely um, kind of critical in my own thinking around catatonia, the neuropsychiatry, um, immunology. Um, and functional aspects of catatonia has been really informed by um, Dr. Rogers' work. So I'm really thrilled that he could be here today. I'll just tell you a little bit about him and then leave the rest of the time for him to share his great talk with us. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Rogers studied medicine at the University of Cambridge before undertaking training uh, in psychiatry at the Maudsley Hospital in London. He recently has finished a PhD in epidemiology um, on the neuropsychiatry of catatonia at the University of College London. His current research focuses on catatonia, um, the psychopharmacology, um, movement disorders, neuroimmunology, and epidemiology of catatonia. Um, clinically, he provides neuropsychiatry input to the encephalitis team at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. And I will say that um, his recent work with the British Association for Psychopharmacology, including the evidence base and consensus guidelines for the management of catatonia, um, was recently published. And I know we've already talked about it widely with in this department, and Dr. Rogers is the first author on that really um, terrific review. So welcome, Dr. Rogers. Um, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for a very warm welcome. It's wonderful to be here in what I consider to be undoubtedly one of the world's uh, most active and most, catat most catatonic, most productive uh, research groups um, in catatonia and indeed in psychiatry in general. So thank you so much. I'm going to start my talk by telling you about uh, an episode that occurred in Vienna in 1833. There was a physician called George Pfendler who was seeing a young lady who was stuporous, mute, holding some awkward postures like the lady in this picture here. And she stopped eating and drinking. And one day, uh, Dr. Pfendler arrived and found that she wasn't responsive at all. These were the days before the widespread use of the stethoscope and he pronounced her dead. The girl was uh, at a funeral and was buried and the only piece of good luck that she had was that she happened to be uh, buried in a nice dress which the grave digger decided would be worth retrieving so he came back later that night and tried to uh, uh, open the coffin only to find that this girl was alive. And of course, she wasn't dead. Uh, she actually had catatonia. Now, this sounds like uh, ancient history um, from uh, almost 200 years ago. Um, and it's good to hear that uh, we have improved in our recognition of catatonia now. So uh, a few months ago, uh, June 2023 in Ecuador, um, catatonia was diagnosed at the funeral when uh, somebody was knocking on their own coffin in order to be let out. Um, but at least she hadn't been buried by that point. So I don't have a financial conflict of interest, but I have an intellectual conflict of interest in that I have a strong vested interest in not being buried alive. And I suggest if you share that conflict of interest, it would be worth uh, knowing something about catatonia, if not for your patient's benefit, at least for your own. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about what catatonia is, um, how you recognise it, what it looks like. And then I'm going to take a dive into some research that we've been doing in London over the past few years, looking at the epidemiology of catatonia, a bit about its structural neuroimaging and some findings on uh, EEG or electroencephalography. So what is catatonia? I think many of us um, start our, our medical and psychiatric careers or our research careers um, with a rather confused idea of what catatonia is. And it's not helped by the fact that there's an array of German, Latin and Greek terms describing um, uh, clinical features which are defined differently in it, wherever you look, essentially. Fortunately, DSM-5 and ICD-11 have actually come up with very similar criteria for and defining catatonia. And I'll take you through them, the, the DSM-5 criteria, very briefly. So stupor is a state of reduced responsiveness to the environment. 
catalepsy is an induced movement disorder. Now, if I were with you in person, I would at this point be asking for volunteers um, to be examined uh, for uh, to demonstrate catatonic features. So you can you can be grateful that I'm only presenting remotely. But catalepsy is an induced movement disorder where you elevate the patient's limb, hold it there, and it remains in that position. Waxy flexibility um, is defined in different ways. Um, it's a steady and even resistance to movement, especially mild rigidity. Mutism, the absence or almost complete absence of speech. Negativism, the motiveless uh, uh, resistance to instructions or even doing the opposite of instructions. Posturing is subtly different from catalepsy. So catalepsy is an induced movement disorder. Posturing is a spontaneous movement disorder. So a patient spontaneously puts their limbs or their body in an awkward position and holds it there against gravity. Mannerisms are exaggerations of um, normal motor acts um, that are inappropriate to the context. Stereotypies are, are motor or verbal acts that are um, not abnormal in and of themselves, but are repeated to the extent that they become abnormal. Psychomotor agitation, as you'll be aware, is not specific to catatonia, but there are a couple of things that are a little bit distinctive about the psychomotor agitation of catatonia. And one is that uh, it can be very extreme and unresponsive to the environment. The second is that one feature of catatonia that's quite characteristic is the alternation between stuporous periods and uh, excitement that can be really very marked. And a common diagnostic error is to say, oh, goodness me, this person's moving around now, they're not catatonic. And in fact, that's that alternation that's, that's very characteristic. Grimacing, and then we have a, a couple of examples of echo phenomena in the DSM-5 criteria. One is echolalia, repeating back the examiner's speech. And for those of you who have toddlers, this will be very familiar. Um, uh, echolalia tends uh, is sometimes it tends not to be the complete sentence, often just the last few utterances. Echopraxia, similarly, um, imitating the examiner's movements. And also it can be a kind of half-hearted attempt at doing so. So the classic test is to scratch one's head like this, and occasionally you'll see a patient elevate their arm a little bit like that. So these are the diagnostic criteria, and DSM says that the clinical state needs to be predominated by three or more of these. In terms of the psychiatric and medical disorders that could be associated with catatonia, for much of the 20th century, catatonia was subsumed into Kraepelin's diagnostic concept of schizophrenia. But since around 1976, um, we've become uh, increasingly aware that actually catatonia um, is not just a feature of schizophrenia. And even further than that, actually, most cases of catatonia uh, do not occur in the context of schizophrenia. <clears throat> so catatonia can occur in the context of a general medical condition and mostly these neurological conditions. Um, it can occur um, in psychotic disorders, affective disorders, and occasionally catatonia um, can occur on its own. Um, so that there's a, a condition known as periodic catatonia, where patients will have relapsing, remitting episodes of catatonia, and there might not be um, another underlying disorder that you can pin it on. So, to bring it all together, catatonia in a slide for those of you who are, are not obsessed with this condition. Fundamentally, I, I view catatonia as um, a deficit in the initiation and termination of movement, speech and complex behaviour. So there are difficulties starting to move and, and there are difficulties stopping movement as well. So the stereotypies. There are speech features that mirror that mirror that as well. So mutism, difficulty starting to speak, and verbiguration, where an individual repeats the same phrase again and again, like a scratch record, they can't stop, or palilalia, where they repeat just a couple of syllables um, again and again. Epidemiology. Well, until recently, um, when uh, Dr. Wilson started uh, working 
on this area. The epidemiology of catatonia really wasn't very well understood, and I'm going to be presenting some data on that shortly. Um, it seemed that catatonia wasn't that common, but beyond that, not much was known, either in terms of its incidence or its longitudinal course. In terms of the common triggers for catatonia, um, some of the more you can get a I sometimes present a presentation with a, a 10 slides with lists of uh, causes of catatonia and you'll be relieved that I'm sparing you that today. Some of the more common triggers are depression, particularly bipolar depression, primary psychotic disorders. I see quite a lot of catatonia in the context of clozapine withdrawal. A patient stops clozapine precipitously and two to three days later they have really quite um, profound and classic catatonic signs. Drug use, um, ketamine uh, and synthetic cannabinoids seem to be uh, common triggers. Um, and autoimmune encephalitis, particularly uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis. About 80% of patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis um, experience catatonia, which is really interesting because this condition involves uh, pathogenic antibodies to the NMDA receptor, a postsynaptic glutamate receptor, and they often develop psychosis better, even more commonly they develop catatonia. In terms of the treatment, there are several things you want to be doing. You want to be looking for the complications of catatonia, um, which can include deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolus, pneumonia, aspiration, um, dehydration. Um, you also want to address the underlying disorder, whether that's a, a, a general medical condition or psychiatric condition. Um, and the, the mainstay of treatment is benzodiazepines and or ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. And catatonia is actually one of the most satisfying psychiatric conditions to treat. Um, because the response could be very rapid. So there are three questions that I've been trying to answer recently about catatonia. And really, the research about cat on catatonia is in its infancy. A lot of the data out there is just based on case reports. So actually just pinning down some very basic questions um, has been really important. The first one is how common is catatonia? Um, there have been studies looking at how common it might be in inpatients, in a psychiatric inpatient setting, but across the population, we haven't known really. Secondly, does it have a neuroimaging signature on structural MRI? So is there something about patients with uh, catatonia that distinguishes them based on a, on a clinical MRI scan? Um, there are all kinds of case reports uh, citing a patient had a lesion to their right parietal lobe or basal ganglia or their left hippocampus and uh, they then developed catatonia. Um, and uh, But what about at a larger scale? Um, are there specific lesions that predispose to catatonia? And thirdly, one real clinical dilemma that I often find in patients with catatonia is that they are admitted to hospital and they come to an emergency department and they obviously can give very little history and it's very hard to work out what's causing it. Um, could this be depression? Could this be schizophrenia? Could this be autoimmune encephalitis or lupus or a stroke? Um, it's very hard to work out what's going on behind it. And the particular question of is this a neurological disorder or a psychiatric disorder um, is important in terms of treatment, but also who gives care to the patients. So we wanted to examine whether the EEG can help us in working out what the etiology of a particular catatonic episode is. So three questions which I'll try to address in turn. Firstly, how common is catatonia? Um, on the right here, you see an editorial in Psychological Med Medicine from a, a British psychiatrist um, called Mahendra in 1981. And he asked the question, where have all the catatonics gone? He said that you read the classic textbooks, you read, read Karl Baum, who described catatonia in 1874, these vivid descriptions of mute patients 
bizarre posturing and echo phenomena, and I just don't see them anymore, he said. And his, argu he, his argument was that um, catatonia may well have been um, a, an epiphenomenon of some virus that was going around in the mid to late 19th century. And that virus isn't really around anymore, and so catatonia doesn't seem to exist anymore. The other explanation um, that's sometimes given is that we are now so good at treating psychiatric disorders that patients don't end up in a catatonic state anymore. <laughs> However, this view is not universally held, and uh, Max Fink and Michael Allen Taylor um, wrote some years later this article called The Catatonia Syndrome, Forgotten But Not Gone. And their argument there is that well, catatonia is just as common as ever, it's just we're not spotting it. And part of that is that psychiatrists aren't examining their patients. And academically, we've lost an interest in the, the motor aspects, the, the psychomotor aspects of psychiatric disorders. So there's a debate, what's happened to catatonia? Does it still exist? And uh, how common is it? Now, the way in which we try to answer this was with electronic healthcare records um, at the Maudsley Hospital. Um, we've got um, an anonymized research database where we take the clinical records and uh, remove the patient identifiers from them. Um, and this is called a clinical record interactive search. Um, one reason why it's particularly helpful for looking at catatonia is that lots of research databases just give you diagnostic codes or structured fields. Chris gives you access to the free text of the patients and in psychiatry in particular a huge amount of everything we say about patients is actually encoded in the free text rather than in those structured fields um, and in catatonia the ICD-10 diagnostic codes that we have are not very helpful um, it's much better in ICD-11 but in ICD-10 there's catatonic schizophrenia and organic catatonic disorder so this misses everyone um, who has uh, uh, catatonia in the context of mania or depression or autism. Um, so what we were able to do with Chris was to, first of all, do a free text search for catatonia and catatonic. Then my ambition was that we'd use a clever natural language processing app that had been developed in order to work out uh, who didn't have catatonia, who, who had catatonia mentioned in their notes merely because their uncle had had it or they'd had it 20 years ago. Um, in fact, we had to abandon the high tech solution because it wasn't very accurate. And instead, I spent a summer with a couple of medical students reading through um, pages and pages of notes from about 2000 catatonic episodes. And in the end, we got it down to uh, about 1400 patients with catatonia in whom we confirm that firstly a clinician made a diagnosis of catatonia and secondly there are at least two features of the Bush Francis catatonia screening instrument present. For some of our analyses we then limited this to the patients who were, who were psychiatric inpatients at the time of catatonia identification and compared them to a control group of psychiatric inpatients. So the basic question, how common is catatonia? And when we just looked at patients from our local area in South London, we found that the incidence was about one in 10,000 person years. Um, which is interesting because it's approximately actually the incidence of schizophrenia. The difference is that schizophrenia um, tends to be much longer lived. Patients with catatonia usually get better. <clears throat> there are limitations to this figure. So firstly, uh, South London has very high rates of psychosis, um, uh, probably due to our, our highly enriched uh, cannabis, um, which is available. Um, and uh, so it's not unlikely that there will be high rates of catatonia as well. Let's have a little bit of a closer look at this population. So one in 10,000 person years. Um, what about the longitudinal course? Well, we're able to follow people up for an average of seven years 
and within that time, one in four of them had a further catatonic episode. However, um, if you look at those who'd had uh, five or more catatonic episodes, they were much more likely to relapse. So they had a 50% a chance of relapse. So it seems that there's a there's a much more recurrent group as well. What about what happened to the incidents over time? So there's this idea that catatonia is dying out. We looked at data over 10 years between 2007 and 2016, and I don't think there's any evidence that catatonia is uh, dying out. And probably actually, it looks like catatonia is becoming more common over this time period. And we tried to explain this by rising numbers of inpatients or growing local population. And when we adjusted for those things, um, the trend remained. So catatonia, if anything, seemed to be on the up. And let's share with you a bit more of the demographics of this patient group. So uh, we've got the inpatients with catatonia here and our control psychiatric patients here. They're slightly younger than average, um, a, a similar um, sex ratio. In terms of their ethnicity, what was quite striking, South London is very ethnically diverse um, and schizophrenia, as you'll be aware, has been linked um, in Britain to uh, Black African, Caribbean and Black British groups, um, particularly first and second generation migrants. Um, but even over and above this risk, um, we found that uh, the catatonia group was much more enriched for these ethnic minority groups, which is very interesting. In terms of the, uh, uh, the, the classified um, ICD-10 diagnoses, um, actually there weren't many organic disorders, um, F0 codes in the catatonia group. Um, small number of neurodevelopmental disorders. Most of our patients had a, 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 a schizophrenia or related diagnosis. And we're also interested in the mortality. So to do this, we conducted a cohort study where we took the patients with catatonia and the patients without catatonia and then followed them up. Um, and we linked to uh, national um, registry data um, for mortality. Unadjusted, uh, the hazard ratio uh, for uh, mortality um, was 0.66. So actually the catatonic patients with this red line here um, seem to be protected from dying, which is really interesting, bearing in mind all the uh, um, medical comorbidities that they suffer from. When we adjusted for other variables, um, this changed, however. So you remember that the catatonic patients were a little bit younger and more likely to be of black ethnicity. Um, and after adjusting for these variables, there didn't seem to be any large difference in the mortality between the two groups. So we had 1,400 patients and we still ended up with a fairly large confidence interval. Um, <coughs> so uh, there is certainly scope to, to to, to refine this confidence interval down and find out what's actually going on here. But you need a very large sample to do it. That's mortality. What about morbidity, the duration of inpatient stay? And here we can see the catatonic group again in red and the comparison group in blue. And you can see that at every point, the catatonia group are staying in hospital longer. The median admission duration was 43 days, which is 50% longer than the non-catatonic group. And this remained after adjusting for various other variables. So even if it's not a risk factor for mortality, patients with catatonia do seem to be staying in hospital quite a lot longer than their peers. So that's a bit of the epidemiology of catatonia. <laughs> I'd like to talk you through our findings on structural neuroimaging now. We were asking the question, can you spot catatonia based on uh, an MRI scan? And we used the same patients we'd identified before. And this time uh, we looked at um, their 
the reports of their MRI scans, and we conducted a case control um, study where our, our outcome was a diagnosis of catatonia, and the control group was psychiatric inpatients without a catatonia diagnosis. And the very basic question we asked was, well, if you have some abnormality on your MRI scan that's big enough to be reported by a neuroradiologist, does that increase your likelihood of a diagnosis of catatonia? So out of our 1,400 patients with catatonia, 79 of them had had an MRI scan. And among our inpatient controls, um, just over 700 of them had an MRI scan. And these are our raw results. So among the patients with uh, catatonia, 34% of them had an abnormal scan. And among the comparison group, 47% of them had an abnormal scan. So uh, this is a rather surprising finding. <clears throat> In fact, it looked like uh, the patients with catatonia were less likely to have an abnormal MRI scan. And the unadjusted odds ratio was 0.57. However, as discussed previously, there are various differences between the catatonic and the non-catatonic group, and particularly in terms of age. <laughs> um, and as well as age, there's also the diagnostic mix. Um, so among the patients who had a scan, 17% had an organic, mostly a dementia diagnosis, as opposed to only three of the catatonia group. So when we adjusted for age, sex, ethnicity and diagnostic group, we actually found that the uh, confidence interval um, overlapped one. Um, the problem with this, though, is that we were getting scans for a very small proportion of all the patients with catatonia and, a, a, and a, an even smaller proportion of the controls. And this is presumably, and this presumably leads to a selection bias where patients aren't given a, a scan at random. Um, patients are scanned because you expect to see something on the scan. And in catatonia, it's likely that people are receiving an MRI scan because uh, they have catatonia. And catatonia is interesting and rare, and people uh, have a higher index of suspicion for a neurological disorder. However, among the control group, patients were probably having a scan because they had a suspicion for dementia, or they had a pre-existing neurological disease, or they had neurological signs and symptoms. So we needed to account for that. And the way we did that was to frame it as a, as a missing data problem. So we had, uh, we had a missing data for most of the catatonia patients in terms of their scan. So we tried to uh, infer what that missing data might be using multiple imputations. So using all the other variables we've got, we try to predict those outcomes. And that gave us an odds ratio of 1.3. But as often happens in multiple imputation, you then get this very broad confidence interval. So to my knowledge, this is the largest uh, study of um, neuroimaging in catatonia. And yet again, it was still far too small to actually get uh, a useful confidence interval. Let's ask the more subtle question then. What do the brain scans of patients with catatonia look like rather than just the crude? Um, what do uh, are they abnormal or not? Let's delve into uh, how they might be abnormal. So among the catatonia group here, you can see that most of the abnormalities were bilateral. Most of them involved that the forebrain, in particular, was the cerebral cortex. And if you look at the abnormalities, most of them were quite non-specific, so they were generalised atrophy, small vessel disease, and white matter lesion. There were two patients who'd had a stroke, but uh, this this was comparatively rare. So the idea that there are focal lesions which habitually cause catatonia wasn't really supported when we had uh, larger data. And in fact, it seems that um, patients with scat with catatonia. Um, have a wide range of pathology. And we published this in the Journal of Neuropsychiatry and Clinical Neuroscience. So final question then, 
we've looked at a bit of the epidemiology and a little bit of the neuroimaging. Does the EEG usefully distinguish a psychiatric from medical catatonia? As I mentioned, this is a, a really important clinical question. And I want to give you a little bit of background um, to uh, the EEG in psychiatry and catatonia. Um, EEG is actually uh, more our domain than you might think. So Hans Berger, who invented the EEG, um, was a psychiatrist. And his idea behind the EEG was that it would allow us to probe mental states and finally understand what was going on in mental disorders. It's, a, it's an old technology. It's been around for about 100 years. Um, and it's essentially the same as an ECG in measuring electrical signals in the heart, um, but in the brain. Of course, you've got to contend with the skull, um, which uh, blunts the recording somewhat. But this chap, Hans Berger, um, it's a rather tragic story. If he looks a little bit eccentric in this photo, um, it might be because he was. Um, he was a great evangelist for EEG and thought it, it, it would fundamentally change our, our concept of psychiatric disorders, but nobody really believed him. And sadly, he, he died by suicide, um, a disappointed man. If only he'd lived um, to see the applications of EEG. So EEG is primarily used in epilepsy, um, but we do have some uses for it in psychiatry as well. So uh, identifying delirium, it can be helpful, particularly if there's uncertainty about whether a patient's presentation is due to delirium or a primary psychiatric disorder. Distinguishing epilepsy from functional or dissociative seizures and EEG, particularly with video telemetry, can be very helpful. Autoimmune encephalitis, um, so it was first described in uh, uh, the, the first antibody was described in 2007 by Joseph Dalmau in Barcelona, and he described NMDA receptor encephalitis. And about half of patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis have a highly specific EEG finding, which is called an extreme delta brush. And so EEG can be useful there. And finally, applying EEG more specifically to catatonia. Um, Status epilepticus um, is usually fairly obvious, but there is a, a form which is less obvious called non-convulsive status epilepticus. And uh, this can be clinically indistinguishable from catatonia, can present with various catatonic signs, and can even respond to the same benzodiazepine treatments as catatonia. And the way to identify that, if we can, with EEG. So, Hansberger's technology uh, was not in vain. What we wanted to do is to try to infer the etiology of catatonia with an EEG. Does it have a psychiatric or a neurological or medical cause? And to do this, we conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of the existing literature, um, which we published in eClinical Medicine. We did the standard search. Uh, thankfully, catatonia is a fairly specific search term. Um, and we looked at a wide range of studies uh, in English, French and Italian. Um, one issue we had to contend with, of course, is the gold standard. Um, if you're doing a diagnostic uh, test accuracy study, um, you need to have some gold standard. And actually thinking this through, we thought the best gold standard would be a considered clinical diagnosis. And this is what we found in terms of the studies. So we identified about 1600 studies from the records and we whittled it down to uh, 355 studies of 707 patients. We subdivided these into two groups. We had larger studies where there were at least five patients. Um, now, these are very useful because we could use um, a bivariate meta-analysis on them, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. They're for, uh, suitable for formal, me formal meta-analysis, and we had 12 of these studies with 308 patients. 
you could then reasonably ask, uh, having this high quality data, why did we bother with the smaller studies? Well, lots of the questions we wanted to ask, um, or we felt we could be asked um, uh, of the results of larger studies. Um, actually, if you want to do, it wasn't possible to do the sensitivity analyses. So for example, um, what about patients who weren't on psychotropic medications? Um, what about patients with pre-existing neurological conditions? And you just don't have that de deal of granularity in the larger studies. So we went through um, 343 case reports or case series and tabulated all their results um, as well. Now, these data are probably going to be a little bit more biased because of the, the reporting bias that comes with case reports, but they do allow this beautiful granular data. And thankfully, actually, the results from the smaller studies were very similar to those from the larger studies. Um, and given that uh, EEG is often a fairly small part of a catatonia case report, it's prob you're probably not going to get too much reporting bias. So this is our um, ROC curve um, for the studies that had uh, patients uh, for, for that had patients that allowed us to calculate the sensitivity and the specificity. And overall, the sensitivity was about 82% and the specificity was about 66%. And I think this low specificity is particularly interesting. Why is it that um, among patients uh, without the diagnosis, without a neurological disorder, purely psychiatric catatonia, um, only 66% of them had a normal EEG. What's driving this low specificity? Well, let's have a look at the individual abnormalities. So these were the small studies, but the results were very similar to the larger studies, and they just allow us to, to look at these specific abnormalities in a bit more detail. So we had any abnormality, sensitivity of 76% and a specificity of 67%. Features of limbic encephalitis, rare, dreadful sensitivity, but entirely 100% specific. Epileptiform discharges, less rare, um, but also highly specific. Any focal abnormality on the EEG, similarly, um, moderately common and highly specific. Status epilepticus, you might imagine, again, not very common, but highly, highly specific for a neurological condition. What's the outlier on this? Well, it's the features of encephalopathy. So, um, sensitivity of 58%, but a specificity of 77%, much, much lower than any of the other abnormalities. So there's this really interesting finding that we had that about a quarter of the so-called psychiatric catatonia patients had generalised slowing on their EEG, a feature that is um, seen in delirium and is quite non-specific to diffuse brain disease in, uh, adva in advanced dementia, for instance. And it's really interesting thinking about what might be causing that. Firstly, were the patients misdiagnosed? And we did various sensitivity analyses to try to address that. So we looked at, well, what if we keep the analysis just to those patients who've had a longer follow-up time of at least a year, say? Um, encephalitis is going to get worse over that period. You're not going to still be diagnosing someone with schizophrenia after a year. Um, what if we just stick with the more recent studies? Um, say the post 2010 studies after encephal autoimmune encephalitis is known about. Um, what if we omit the patients who had psychotropic medications? And we tried all those sensitivity analyses and it really didn't make very much difference. Um, so I think it's possible actually that we, we're not missing some known neurological diagnosis here, but I think it's likely that either there are neurological conditions we don't know about that are causing catatonia. Or, more controversially still, there's something about a profoundly 
abnormal mental state in catatonia that can render an EEG abnormal. So let's conclude. Firstly, how common is catatonia? Well, it's got an incidence of about one in 10,000 in the general population. Does catatonia have a neuroimaging signature on structural MRI? Probably not, to be honest. Um, you could take this further. We just looked at the reports of uh, MRI scans. You could actually analyze the raw images and there is probably mileage in that, but I'm very skeptical about doing it with our data because of the selection bias, which is just impossible to get rid of. And thirdly, can you infer the etiology of catatonia using EEG? Well, I think the answer to that is yes, but it depends what the abnormality is. Um, a, a generalized background slowing is nonspecific in catatonia. Interestingly, um, we're now trying to replicate this same study using psychosis. Can you identify so-called organic psychosis from primary psychotic disorder uh, using EEG? And the results actually seem really different to the uh, catatonia results. Um, and there doesn't seem to be this generalized slowing that's common in psychotic presentations. So generalized slowing is not useful in catatonia EEGs but other EEG abnormalities such as uh, interictal epileptical discharges, status epilepticus, vocal um, abnormalities, and extreme delta brush are really helpful. So if you're interested in catatonia, um, as Dr. Wilson said, we've recently uh, finished the, the, the British Association for Psychopharmacology catatonia guidelines. And we go into much more depth there about um, catatonia and autism, catatonia in medical conditions, uh, periodic catatonia. We've got a, a website on catatonia um, that I think for the first time produced um, some information for patients and carers about catatonia. So it's confusing to clinicians. It's uh, terrifying for patients and relatives. And uh, I always love to discuss cases as well. I'd be very interested to hear about your experiences of catatonia as well and any questions you have. Thank you. Dr. Rogers, thank you so much for that excellent talk. Um, you know, you very nicely talked about some of the challenges of identifying hallmarks, understanding more of the pathophysiology of catatonia, whether it's in a psychiatric inpatient population or a primary medical population, and you discuss some of the challenges of structural MRI and EEG, where do you think we go from here? How do we understand the mechanisms underlying the phenotype of catatonia? How do you think we take the science further? Thank you. Um, it's obviously a really important question. Um, I think the mistake we've sometimes made is to consider catatonia as a whole. And I think there are very understandable reasons for doing that in that it's not that common um, and we want to find cases. Um, but I think if you look at the ways in which catatonia has advanced historically, it's by separating it up and it's been taking tiny slivers at, at a time. So a tiny sliver of Wilson's disease, a tiny sliver are the West Bowl variant of Huntington's disease. And then more recently, another two to five percent to autoimmune encephalitis. And I think there is probably more mileage to go with the autoimmune encephalitis story. But the area that's really exciting me at the moment over the last five years has been the genetics of catatonia. Um, so periodic catatonia was described by father and son psychiatrist combo, uh, guessing and guessing. Um, and then in the 1990s, a German group uh, described linkage to uh, 15Q15 and 22Q13. And then more recently, we've discovered that actually the 15Q15 locus is um, Bill McDermott syndrome and the Shank 3 mutation. And I think there are probably several other behavioural genetic disorders that we'll be able to find that way. <laughs> 
particularly in patients uh, who have catatonia plus learning disability or another neurodevelopmental disorder. It looks like Josh Smith, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thank you again, uh, Dr. Rogers. This is a great talk. Um, thank you again for speaking to us. I um, I was curious about the prevalent studies. Are those you may have said, and I may have, are those inclusive of catatonia and neurodevelopmental conditions? That's a good point. So, um, Solmi in 2018 did a, a meta-analysis of catatonia prevalence um, and actually found a lot of studies um, and their headline figure was that um, across uh, psychiatric and medical inpatient settings the prevalence of catatonia is about nine percent. Um, very little neurodevelopmental um, work in there. Um, I'm not sure if there were any studies. Um, I, I don't know about you but I have reservations about um, some of those studies in that uh, there was a study by van der Hayden and colleagues in 2005 where they looked at clinical diagnoses of catatonia across the clinical service and found that about two percent of patients in a psychiatric setting had catatonia and then they took researchers around with clipboards uh, ticking off symptoms and they found a prevalence of about 18 percent and I think if you're not careful with some of those clinical features like stupor and mutism, you're diagnosing everyone in a coma or even everyone who's asleep uh, with catatonia. So I, I think you can't leave your your psychiatric knowledge behind when you when you complete the Bush Francis. Yeah, I, I, it, it's, it's challenging when so many of the core features of autism in particular, you know, somebody with autism may walk around with a Bush Francis of 10 you know, or or even 15 based on their level of impairment um, and being able to tease those things apart. And you sort of touched on this with your answer for Dr. Wilson, but I it feels like we're almost going to have to treat it from a research perspective, catatonia and aut autism as a separate distinction when we're looking at things like EEG, MRI, because the, the, the phenotypes are so variable, uh, not just across catatonia, but across autism too. Would you What's your take on that? I completely agree with you, actually. Um, we I, I didn't present it today, but we looked in more detail about the psychopathology and the phenomenology of catatonia in our cohort. And we we split patients up by diagnostic groups and we found that the the ASD group were, were rather different. They had fewer negative features of catatonia and more positive features. They were more highly relapsing um than the, the non-ASD group um anecdotally um they seem very difficult to treat but uh, you, you're the expert on that um and I'm sure they all get better with you <laughs> that's uh that's very kind of you <laughs> uh that does not always happen but I appreciate that yeah I I think that the the anecdotal reports of you know challenging symptoms recurrence all of that certainly I think fits between the, what we you know see in clinic and What's in the data too? Thank you again. Are there other questions? We we still have about ten minutes, which is terrific. Oh, I see Dr. Hackers. Yes, uh, thank you, Jonathan. This was a great uh, review of uh, kind of where we are, and particularly with an interest in the epidemiology, which is a kind of uncharted territory and. You and Joellen uh, are making really important contributions there. Um, you did a very nice job in educating us on those 12 uh, features that are recognized in the DSM. Um, how did we end up in, in the situation that we are focusing on those 12? Um, what are your thoughts on this? Um, the prevalence of those symptoms varies tremendously from found in almost 50% of any sample um, versus less than 5%. Um, how did we, because you got us back, I think, to Vienna in the 1830s. Um, so how did we end up with this uh, interesting constellation of signs? Again, ICD is slightly different from the DSM. The note of rating scale is very different from the Bush-Francis. Um, 
you have brought together a really good group of people for some consensus um, assessments when it comes to diagnosis and treatment. What can we do to get people on the same page to even say this is catatonia and these are the symptoms that we actually want to understand? Mm. I think it's it's very challenging without biomarkers. Um, and we agonized somewhat over the definition of catatonia in those guidelines. Um, my my argument was that um, cat uh, the, the one thing we do have in favor of that diagnostic construct is the treatment response, um, which is usually very good to benzodiazepines. I'm a little bit more skeptical about uh, validating with a treatment response to ECT because ECT can treat so many things from depression to Parkinson's disease. Um, however, that then led to problems when we came to the treatment section. So we're saying uh, we've got this condition that we define based on a response to lorazepam. And then isn't it wonderful that we've got this treatment that's so effective in patients where we've defined the condition as based on the effectiveness of that treatment. Um, in terms of how we've arrived at this point, um, there are a huge number of catatonic signs. I think some people have listed, uh, people have certainly listed more than 50, possibly as many as 100. Um, many of them are not very specific, um, which makes sense of them being di discarded when it comes to diagnostic criteria. But I think lots of them just haven't been studied. And certainly in our work, because we we're looking retrospectively, we weren't able to uh, comment, say, on the, the frequency of psychological pillow um, or on catatonic pupil, this fixed dilated pupil you get uh, occasionally, um, just because nobody's spotting it. Um, so I think a good, uh, a good way for us to, to go forward would be to uh, examine for these signs and document them at least so that the next generation of researchers will have the evidence on which to base their diagnostic criteria. You know, I think you bring up a really interesting point, the two of you do. How do we think about these non-responders, people that, you know, meet catatonia criteria, they, they look just like any other catatonic patient who might respond to lorazepam, you give them lorazepam and either they very partially respond or, or they don't respond and make them quite sedated, maybe even delirious. And it, it poses a lot of challenges for people working, you know, in the, in the primary medical space, working with older adults, working with those who have more comorbidities. Um, it's, it presents a real diagnostic challenge. I'll, I'll let you comment on that. And then I see one of our trainees, Michelle, looks like she might have a question, so. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think the, the first point is that ideally you don't want to be in that situation. And there are several studies showing that um, treating earlier is associated with a higher probability of responding to lorazepam. Um, so ideally, if, if we're treating soon, uh, we, we're going to get fewer of these treatment responses to treatment resistant cases. The second point is that uh, given that response is usually so good, if a patient isn't responding, I think it should make you reevaluate the diagnosis. And there were there was a a, a paper of uh, treatment resistant cases um, published a few years ago where they found that two of their treatment resistant cases actually had Parkinson's disease. Um, and then the third point is, I think often the best route thereafter is just trying lots of stuff. Um, the evidence for benzodiazepines is not good. We don't have, uh, it's not supported by a randomized controlled trial. So anything beyond that, the evidence base is dreadful. Um, lots of us in the catatonia world tend to use NMDA receptor antagonists as a next line. Um, and uh, in, if you look at the literature, I think every single case report that's been published shows that they work well. And yet, if you speak to people who use them, I uh, get very mixed results, actually. Um, so the literature is very biased. It gives you ideas of what to try, but not, not a great clue. Great answer. I think we've got enough time for maybe another question or two. 
I have another if there's not <laughs> if there's not an additional one I will I will wait for a moment though. I think so. Okay. okay, so you're you're talking about ECT as a means for assessing clinical improvement in the face of like lorazepam. We'll call it resistance for lack of a better term. I think um, I, I definitely agree with you. I think it becomes diagnostically really challenging to ascertain what is the underlying condition causing catatonia um, when you're using ECT because in theory, right, you're treating psychosis, mood disorders, et cetera. Um, I, I think the potentially the one caveat there may be in the neurodevelopmental space where we have a confirmed neurodevelopmental diagnosis prior to catatonia onset, where you know if someone has um, a history of you know significant social emotional impairment and autism develops catatonia, then potentially we could. I mean, you can't fully make the argument because folks with autism have psychiatric comorbidity, you know, at a pretty high frequency, but you could potentially make the argument, okay, ECT may be a, you know, possible avenue of confirming the diagnosis when they respond positively. What What's your agree, disagree? Yeah, I know that um, Andrew Francis of the, of the Bush Francis catatonia rating scale ma makes this argument and he presents a case of a patient with like they had OCD and then they responded to ECT, but I mean, there are also case reports of OCD responding to ECT. Um, Parkinson's disease, neuroleptic malignant syndrome can respond to ECT. I suppose that the other way of looking at it is that actually there's something that these conditions have in common. And I'm increasingly wondering if actually striatal dopamine is the substrate that subtends psychomotor speed in a transdiagnostic fashion. So not just in Parkinson's disease, but also in neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And then there's some circumstantial evidence for it in catatonia as well. So some of you might be aware of the F-DOPA PET studies showing high striatal dopamine in people with schizophrenia, and you've got your normal healthy controls. And in three of those studies, there have been patients with catatonic schizophrenia. And in all, all three of those studies, the catatonic schizophrenia patients have been down there. The other piece of circumstantial evidence is that levodopa seems to work to treat catatonia. It's a dreadful idea because it's going to worsen the psychosis. Um, but actually, I think probably these conditions all have a bit more in common than we, than we think they do. Excellent. Well, Dr. Rogers, Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. I know it's really late where you are. Um, but we certainly appreciate your visit to Vanderbilt today and this excellent Grand Rounds. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Oh. Oh, I think others are leaving, but oh, okay, take I care. Stopped the, I stopped the recording already, but you did. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you all. Okay, thanks, Jenny. Appreciate it.